want to take, um, save myself the 20 bucks. You know, I, so I used my Alaska Airlines miles. I didn't realize Alaska. It was like 20 bucks each. First class. That's okay. You're paying for the hotel. I talked to Susan about the last time. Yeah. You know what? She, she went through some...
Hello, church. Good morning. Aloha. Ciao. Of course, uh, this is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, and as you have seen earlier on our screens, it is Laity Sunday. Today is a day we celebrate the ministry of the laity. And if you do not know who the laity are, just go and face the mirror and you will find out. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church in Torrance. This is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. If you have your cell phones with you or your mobile devices, kindly place them on silent mode so that we don't get distracted as we worship. And I've been saying this for the last several Sundays, if you have the talent or even, the, not just the talent, but if you love singing, if, even if you can't read notes or you don't know how to sing, Join us in the choir, and we have a very good choir director and a very good accompanist, organist, and we will help each other as we sing praises to our Lord. So please, join our choir. And if you have prayer requests, just fill up the pink slips on your pew racks, or if you are tuning in on Facebook Live or YouTube, just place them on the comment section and we will get them to uh, the pastor when it comes time to prayer. And because we have so many things this morning, let us start with it. The peace of Christ be with you, always. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. And to prepare ourselves for worship, let us join together in the call and response to worship. Come, now is the time to worship. When the Israelites worshiped the golden calf, God listened to, listened to Moses and chose to correct instead of destroy. Jesus tells a story of a wedding banquet where the guests dismissed the invitation and harmed the messengers. So the king invited people off the streets and welcomed all who received the invitation in earnest. Too often we turn from God's ways, choosing our stiff neck insistence that we know what is best instead of trusting God's provision, love, and guidance. Come, now is the time to worship. Please stand as you are able for the singing of our opening hymn.
Good morning. Boys and girls, I'm going to go ahead and have you sit kind of close where you're going to be standing because you're going to sing right after the children's time. Fantastic. All right. <gasps> no spot. How about over here? There you go. Can you scooty bottom a little bit? So thank you, Naja. Thank you. All right. How are you? Good. You're going to be singing in a minute. Are you a little nervous about that? No. Oh, good. I'm so glad. So just. Put your chin up, shoulders back, and own it like a boss when the time comes, right? I do want to talk today about being nervous, and more specifically, about feeling uneasy. Have you ever felt uneasy? Feeling uneasy usually comes as a result of having other feelings. So we feel that weird feeling in our tummy because we're afraid or we're upset or we're nervous. It's just that weird, not quite right feeling. Have you ever had that? Yeah? What kinds of things make you feel uneasy? Wow, you're just brave all the time? That is so awesome. You know what makes me feel uneasy? Is speaking in front of a lot of grown-ups, okay? And the funny thing is, that's my job. I do that for my job. And every time I get, I feel uneasy before I speak to a lot of grown-ups. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I want to share a story with you. Maybe you know it. It is um, a book called Jabari Jumps. Have you, do you know that book? If you haven't read it before, it's a picture book. And so even if you're a little bit older, I'd still invite you to read it because it's probably going to remind you of some feelings that you've, you've had before. Um, but Jabari is a little boy who goes to the pool, and he decides that he is going to go off of the high dive. Okay, and he's super, super excited about it at first, but then he feels a little bit nervous. And you can see in this picture, the grown-ups can't see it, but he's holding his dad's hand. And when he looks at the high dive and how all the people at the top of the high dive look so tiny and ready to jump off, he gets a little nervous and that makes him feel uneasy. And so he decides, you do, oh, I love it too. One of my favorite books. Oh, nice. Okay, so you will have to absolutely do a book review for all of your friends, all right? But you can see here Jabari's looking way up at the ladder that goes all the way up to the high dive, and then he starts telling people, you can go in front of me if you want to. And then he says, oh, wait a minute, you know what? I, I forgot to do my stretches, so I'm going to do those first, okay? But then his dad tells him something that's super, super important, and it stayed with me from this book, and I'm going to read you that little bit. It says, It's okay to feel a little scared, said his dad. Sometimes I feel a little scared. I take a deep breath, and I tell myself, I am ready. And you know what? Sometimes it stops the feeling scary and it feels a little like a surprise. Jabari loved surprises. 
Every time I feel uneasy about speaking in front of grown-ups, I remember something that I learned, actually, when I was in college. And that is that the same place in your brain that makes you feel anxious or uneasy is the same place in your brain that makes you feel excited. And so when you're feeling uneasy, if you can remember that part about your brain and tell yourself, I don't need to be afraid, I can be excited, then it helps a lot. But what really, really helps more than anything else, boys and girls, when I feel uneasy, is I talk to God first. And I pray and I tell him, dear God, I am feeling super, super nervous and uneasy right now. And I know that you can't give me a hug for real, but I'm gonna give myself a hug from you. And I'm gonna pray that you'll be with me through the next hour or however long I'm going to be talking with grown-ups. And it always, always helps. So the next time that you're uneasy, and grown-ups, you can use this too, the next time that you're uneasy, do you think you can remember to do that? Okay. Let it be a surprise, because on the other side are good things. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for this day and for this space where we can come together as a church family and worship you. Oh God, there are a lot of things that happen to us that make us feel nervous or scared or angry, and sometimes that puts uneasy feelings in our heart and in our tummy. When that time happens, oh God, we pray that you'll be with us to hold our hand and to help us feel your squeeze of love for us and to let us know that you are always with us and that you'll help us to get to the other side. Remind us, oh God, that when we're anxious, we can actually help ourselves to make it feel a little bit like a surprise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand and look to Miss Lynn for direction. I'm going to move the microphone so we can all hear you, okay?
So today is Laity Sunday, and as I said earlier, if you do not know who the laity are, you just need to look into the mirror because the laity is all of us. Now, we might say Pastor Jacob is not laity, but he was before he became pastor. And it, we are all the body of Christ and I read somewhere that the laity started from two words in Greek that really meant the people of God. The people of God. It just developed sometime, somewhere, that it became, it, the meaning became like people who are not trained. That's not true. Because we are always trained. We call it the ministry of the people of God, the ministry of the laity. So today we are honoring those people around us. We're honoring ourselves actually as we uh, celebrate this laity Sunday. And before I do that, uh, if you go to the uh, back um, in our reception place, you will see a sign-up sheet. And this is where you will find the ways we serve as laity in the body of Christ. We will see opportunities for service. And if you are so moved, please take one, fill it up, put your name, your landline, your cell phone, your email, and then check off the boxes where you feel you will be able to serve. So, um, and as we honor our, our la laity today, the one way of putting it is we honor our volunteers. So when I call these people or these groups, if you belong to these groups, please stand and be recognized. First, we have our Sunday school volunteers. Uh, Mark Musari is our superintendent for children. Where's Mark? Yoli Tanemura is the superintendent for the youth. And let uh, all the Sunday school teachers please stand and be recognized. Now, as you will... As you will find out from this, there are several ministry teams or ministry groups that serve as volunteers in our church. Of course, um, we have our co-lay leader. Uh, he's somewhere there in the back, uh, Scott Wolverton. Um, the recording secretary of our church council is Leah Wolverton. Our treasurer is Lori Concepcion. And even as we honor Lori Concepcion, there's Kathy all somewhere there. And Kathy has been our treasurer for a very long time. And we need to thank her for her service. Lori Clausen is now our assistant treasurer. Sue Schur is our financial secretary. <laughs> Judy Pro is our chair of the finance committee. <laughs> Peter Davis, where's Peter? He is the chair of our permanent endowment committee. <laughs> Gary Wolverton is the chair of our board of trustees. Aida Uy is the chair of our SPRC. <laughs> SPRC is the Staff Parish Relations Committee. Sherry Pulley is the chair of our Caring Ministry. <laughs> Carmen Oliver, my boss, she's the chair of our Outreach Ministry. <laughs> of course, um, we need people to chair our other ministry teams, the Christian Education Ministry Team, the Worship Ministry Team, and of course we have at-large members in our church council. 
Uh, Phil is one of them. Gwen is another. Um, there's several others. We have members to our annual conference. Our life does not only revolve in our local church. We belong to the bigger church, the annual conference, and the bigger church, the denomination. Lay members to our annual conference are uh, Scott Wolverton, Claudia Wolverton. Now, of course, of course, every Sunday, we have people who run our worship. We have the greeters who meet us at the door, and a lot of you volunteer as greeters. We have acolytes, uh, children and young people who serve as acolytes. We have liturgists who read our scripture. And then we have our communion steward, Raquel Cacho, where is she? Um, then, of course, we have our communion helpers. We get them every communion Sunday, they help us. And our blood pressure nurses, Esther is one of them. They take care of our, they, they monitor our blood pressure and scold us if, if our blood pressure is high. <laughs> of course, every Sunday, we have the choir. And we have ushers. Uh, Victor is there. Willie Lasarte, Dexter Kudal, Rolly Cacho, Rudy Carlos. Where's Rudy? And then, of course, Cherry Legaspi also serves as usher. And then we have our palace singers, directed by Ben Ruben Legaspi. Our rejoice singers, directed by Lynn de la Cruz. The accompanies for the rejoice, James. There's James. And Danielle also. And of course, we cannot have this sound and we cannot project on YouTube or Facebook Live with our, without our tech team. Scott, <laughs> Leah, Rachel, and Adam. And uh, because they've been serving our church for so long, I would just like to uh, give some special gifts uh, to those um, members of our tech team. You know, when the pandemic hit, there were only a handful of people who came to this sanctuary every Sunday to bring us the worship service online. And they came here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday faithfully, and we were able to worship together even in the online space because of them. So please, um, Scott, we have a gift for you. <laughs> Leah, gift for you. Rachel. singers for over 30 years, I believe, and faithfully directing our palace singers is Ben Ruben Legaspi. Ben. And of course, the, vit the a vital part of our children's ministry, and now the Rejoice Singers, Linda La Cruz. <clears throat> I 
I should also mention that for a long, long time, our church auditor was Steve Stevens. We should recognize Steve. And now that Steve Stevens has retired, now we have, although he has not been promoted to Sunday school yet, our new church auditor is Nonoy. Where's Nonoy? So, now if you have noticed, I have called almost everyone in our congregation, and you know that. You, even those of you whose names have not been called, you belong to the committees, the ministry teams, and you should celebrate yourselves for the service that you do. And now we go to the church concerns and announcements. Now let me go to the announcements first. Like I mentioned, um, I think um, if, you, if you can pick up this sign-up sheet, then uh, please uh, fill them up and offer your time and your talent. And before I go to the church announcements, um, Margie, you have something to say. Good morning, church. Uh, I'm Margie Jones, speaking on behalf of the United Women in Faith, formerly known as United Methodist Women. By now, all you regular attenders know that our church is hosting a salad bar luncheon for the PEO organizations in the South Bay. This is a major fundraiser for missions for the United Methodist Church. A big thank you for all of you who have volunteered to make salads and cookies and help with setup, serving, and cleanup. Uh, even if you have only one hour this Wednesday to help, um, drop on by and give us, give us your time. It's really heartening to see everybody pulling through to make this first uh, project since the pandemic uh, come together. If you have any questions, please check with Barbara Smith, Claudia Wolverton, or Yoli Tanimura today. Um, thank you so much for all your help. And we will have a very brief meeting today um, after worship to finalize our plans. And next Sunday, we'll have a regular meeting, and we're on to planning our next activity for Christmas. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Our flowers this morning is given uh, by Wilma Ryder for the glory of God. Um, the Stillman Sawyer Family Service Center food basket uh, donations are given by Andrew and Wendelin Gambrell in celebration of their seventh wedding anniversary on October 14th, and by Kathy Old in celebration of her birthday today. Happy birthday, Kathy. Uh, the Tuesday morning Bible study continues, and. Uh, if you go to our church website, you will find the Zoom ID for that. Uh, please join us. It's every Tuesday morning from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., led by our, of course, good-looking Asian pastor. The chancel choir, as I've been mentioning for several Sundays now, um, they rehearse uh, every Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock and then Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Please join our choir. Of course, uh, it's been mentioned already, um, uh, the PEO luncheon on uh, Wednesday. Uh, next Sunday, October 22nd at 11, a brief teacher training will be held in the Sunday school room for anyone interested in teaching Sunday school, pre-K to youth age. We'll introduce you to the curriculum and go over Sunday school schedule. 
So if you feel called to teach in Sunday school, now we have a few uh, here in the pink cards. At the memorial service for Danny Valenzuela, the uh, son of our former um, youth director, family ministry director, Becky, will be at Murrieta UMC on Saturday at 6 p.m. Atria Cereso, the daughter-in-law of Gwen, uh, is celebrating her birthday on Wednesday, October 18th. Happy birthday. <laughs> Lina Enriquez Santos, my very best friend, is, was at, is lying in an AC, ICU bed, ventilating, ventilated and fighting for her life. Please pray for her. From Esther Urquina. And, oh, Manny and Evelyn Galeon are celebrating 64 years on, Mon on Wednesday, October 18. Happy anniversary. Are there any other prayer concerns or praises you want lifted up? Pastor. Let us pray. <clears throat> Let us pray. But I'm going to start with a silent prayer uh, today. Maybe God, we need this moment of silence, the moment of peace, because it's really hard for us to hear your voice with all the noise from the world. All the noise from the world give us fear, disappointment, worry, despair, but God, Help us to stay in silence so that we can hear your voice, your voice of promise, of your presence. We desperately search you, your presence, your, your guidance in this world. We are so broken, oh God. We don't know what to do, how to deal with all the situations surrounding us. So we look up to you. So guide us and lead us with your spirit. Especially help us to find true peace. The peace that you promise in our lives. At this morning, we lift up to you many of our church family members dealing with so many challenges in their lives. Loss of loved ones, dealing with all these illnesses, cancer, stay in a hospice care, and I see you. God, you know all the situation. God, we ask you to provide your true solution, true healing, your presence upon all these situations. Your presence is essential for all of us. Your peace and strength is needed in our challenges. So God, provide your peace, your strength, your comfort to our family members dealing with this stormy situation in their lives. Help them to hear your voice. Help them to Feel your presence within all this stormy situation. But this morning we come here to worship you and praise you. Help us to feel your presence in this space. 
so that we can recharge ourselves with your spirit so that we can go out to this dark new world to shine the light that you've given us. Thank you, God, for all the presence, all the guidance, and all the strength that you provide for us. Let us continue in prayer with a prayer that Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and glory forever. Amen. We have a special offertory music today. These beautiful little girls. Okay, come up. Come up. Okay, Ushers, come forward, please. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Mighty and righteous God, as we bring our tithes and offerings to your altar, 
We confess we see ourselves in the stiff-neckled Israelites in the wilderness. We are quick to lose sight of you, especially when our focus is turned in the direction of gold. Your anger and disappointment are so justified. And as Moses intervened for the Israelites, Jesus has advocated for us with his very life. Help us to keep our focus as you light the pathway you would walk, have us walk. We pray this with gratitude for your love and in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came, uh, came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the mist of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, come. I looked and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine and pestilence and by the wild animals of the earth. The word of the Lord.
I know what you're probably thinking. Revelation? Really? Methodists don't read Revelation. Let's look at that. First, will you pray with me? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. I want to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, the, the interpretation I'm following in this is from uh, Professor Craig Kester of Luther's Seminary. He authored a very large volume uh, commentary for um, Anchor Bible Series, but he also wrote this very accessible book called Revelation and the End of All Things. If you're interested in the study of Revelation, this little book will be very helpful, I think. And it's even translated in Korean. <laughs> So, did the reading of the scripture create in you a sense of uneasiness? That was the point, after all. I'm sure I caused some uneasiness when I turned the text in for this morning. Current events in our world, our nation, and our neighborhoods also bring a feeling of uneasiness to us. Revelation, in its own way, speaks to that. Dr. Kester put it this way. The principal purpose of the visions in Revelation 6 is to awaken a sense of uneasiness in the readers by vividly identifying threats to their well-being. Before getting into the text from today, we should look at its context and do a quick review of um, the beginning of Revelation. In chapter 1, we see that John is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And John is told, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatera, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Chapters 2 and 3 are letters to these seven churches. And reading these letters is important for us to understand what John says in the rest of the book. You will find three characteristics in these churches. Those that are dealing with some form of persecution, churches that are assimilating with the Roman culture, and churches that have become complacent in our beliefs. Hey, maybe there's another sermon in there. In chapter 4, John looks, and there in heaven a door stood open, and a voice like a trumpet said, Come up here. In chapter 5, John sees the one seated on the throne, and this one has a scroll in his hand. The scroll has seals on it, and apparently, no one can open the seals, causing an angel to ask, who is worthy to open it? So I'm guessing at this point that God has the heavenly equivalent of the Staff Parish Relations Committee conduct a wide search to find someone worthy. They scoured the entire earth and all of heaven, but came up empty. So John begins to weep. One of the elders says to John, do not weep. We have found that the Lion of Judah is worthy. The Lion of Judah? So what or who is this Lion of Judah? This is picture language, and this is how revelation works. We should ask, what does a lion remind us of? Power, ferocity, maybe kingship? I think we'll find that Disney provides all of the exegetical insight we might need with the Lion King. Um, after hearing this, John turned to look and he saw a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. Let me say that again. John heard about the Lion of Ju Judah. When he turned to look, he saw a lamb. So we ask, what does a lamb remind us of? 
gentleness, vulnerability, a sacrifice? Do we get the point? Do we know who this picture language is referring to? Yes, Jesus. Jesus is the lion and the lamb. Now that was pretty easy to figure out, wasn't it? The picture lag language was, is not intended to conceal. It is intended to reveal. The word revelation or apocalypse in Greek means to reveal something, to uncover something. Now we get to chapter 6. John is still in the heavenly throne room, still in the spirit on the Lord's day, still receiving a message to write in a book and to help with our text. I want to use some artwork. An artist named Albrecht Dürer lived from 1471 to 1528. He produced probably the most famous image of this part of Revelation, and he called it the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. What Dürer does is brilliant is the way he arranges the horsemen. He puts the first horse and rider farthest away so that each successive horseman comes closer to us in the image. We have learned that Jesus is worthy to open the seals on the scroll. So upon opening the first seal, we have a voice loud like thunder. Wiley did a good job there. Come! John saw a white horse whose rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And you can see the rider in the back right with the bow there. Now we need to ask, are we here in America expecting to turn on the news one day and find the cameras focused on a rider on a white horse holding a bow coming up the street, maybe in downtown Los Angeles or maybe riding up to the Capitol in Washington, D.C.? No. Even the most literal commentators of this text understands that this is not a literal image. We are still dealing with picture language. The text says that the writer came out conquering and to conquer. So we can probably say that this horse or this picture image represents conquest. So what is conquest? Conquest happens out there at the borders. When one nation overruns the border of another nation, it has to do with invasion, with coming over the border from one territory into another. It's the threat of being conquered by someone else. We need to ask, would, John, would this have meant, in, it meant anything to John's readers? Do you think that they would have understood this? Remember, John's readers were living in the most secure nation on the planet. The Romans had the biggest military budget, the most sophisticated military technology, and they had the largest army. Now, did the Romans have the largest military budget and the largest army because they felt so secure? Perhaps it was because they didn't. This first horseman raises an interesting question for us. It asks, how secure are we? How secure are we as a nation? Are we worried about our borders? Are other countries worried about their borders? After this, revelation brings the threat a step closer to us. Watch what happens. In verse 3, we have the second seal opened. And the living creature called out, Come, and out came a rider on a bright red horse. This rider takes peace from the earth and causes people to slaughter one another. In our image, he is one horse closer to us, holding the sword. The second horseman brings the threat a step closer to us. Now we are not talking about what is happening out there on the borders. It has to do with the violence that people do to one another. The threat comes a step closer. The first horseman asks, how secure are you as a nation, as a people? The second horseman brings the violence a step closer and asks, what is the violence that you do to one another? How secure are you in your homes and in your communities? How secure are you where you live? 
It's about the violence that we do to one another. It's not about them and us. It's about us and us. Would the second horseman have resonated with people in John's time? Did they ever worry about violence in Ephesus? Were there streets in Pergamum where you'd rather not be seen after dark? Would you really care to go down to the waterfront in Smyrna in the middle of the night? Can we relate to this second horseman? What is the violence that we do to one another? Turning on the news, we can experience this. We've seen bombings at sporting events, mass shootings all over, and probably what is the worst, and child abuse. Unfortunately, this could be a very long list. But now the third seal is opened, and John hears the f familiar call to come. This time he sees a rider on a black horse with a pair of scales, and we hear about a quart of wheat costing a day's pay. Durer puts that horseman right in the middle of the image. This is the one we're likely to see when we first look at the picture. This horse has to do with your pocketbook. One thing that was different then from now is the scales now most often represent the criminal justice system. In John's time, it represented commerce. You would weigh out your payment for your purchases. Inflation was so high back then that a common laborer could only produce, uh, purchase one quart of wheat for an entire day's wage. He might be able to purchase enough grain to grind f flour for a couple of medium-sized loaves of bread. Or maybe a poorer family should go for the three quarts of barley. It was less nutritious but cheaper, so the money would go farther in filling you up. At this point, we don't even care about the olive oil and the wine. We just spend our whole paycheck putting bread on the table. This horseman is asking us, how secure are you in your ability to make a living? How secure are you in your ability to feed our families? How secure am I? It's talking about the threat of having to blow your entire day's pay to put a little bread on the table. Did the people in John's time ever worry about feeding their families? Maybe not in Laodicea. They were rich and prosperous. You got to read chapters 2 and 3. We can follow the trend here. Can we relate to the threat of inflation and having to make ends meet? Are we worried about the cost of food? Now the fourth seal is open to the call of come. And it was a pale green horse. In Greek, its color is called chloros. It's that moldy, sickly color of things that have gone bad. Its name was, was death, and Hades followed it. This horseman brings the threat of death right into our laps. This is a horseman you might not even see when first looking at the picture. Hades followed him. Hades is in the corner of your picture in the lower left hand there. Looks like a monster. Hades is the Greek word, word for the Hebrew Sheol, where Sheol is the realm of the dead. Isaiah 5.14 describes Sheol like this. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure. This is how the picture language works. It keeps asking one after another after another, how secure are you as a nation? How secure are you in your communities? How secure are you financially? How secure are you in terms of your own life and health? One after another, these threats keep coming a little closer. Would people in John's time say these threats are real? Do these horsemen represent things that are real? Did they worry about violence? Did they worry about feeding their families? I think that we can say yes. It is talking about threats that were real. Are these things real for people in 21st century America? 
Do people in America ever worry about national security? Do we ever worry about our borders? Do people in, in our neighborhoods ever worry about the violence that we do to one another? Do people in America ever worry about the economy? Do people ever worry about feeding their families? Do the poor neighborhoods only have access to cheap, low-nutrition food, fast foods? Do people in America ever worry about their own death? Do people ever worry about a loved one's death? This is the power of the picture language. These horsemen represent threats that are real. They were real for people in John's time. They're real for people in our time. They've been real for everybody in between. That's the power of this imagery. One after another, these images strip away the pretensions that my life is just fine. I'm perfectly secure. Everything is fine. Revelation responds with, oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? One after another, after another, these horsemen keep coming at us. In Revelation 6, there are a couple more seals that will continue our sense of uneasiness. But then in chapter 7, John hears about the 144,000 to be sealed, but turns and looks and sees a great multitude that no one can count. Again, John hears one thing and sees something different. John hears about the 144,000 to be sealed, but turns and looks and sees a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they fell on their face before the throne, worshiping God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is where God brings us to. This is where God wants us to be. After all of the uneasiness, God brings us to worship. Oh Lord, I want to be in that number, that number that no one can count when the saints go marching in. Did you realize that when the saints go marching in is a musical rendition of the apocalypse? Throughout the book of Revelation, we will see this cycle. We saw the un uh, uneasiness with the seals, then worship. We'll have the trumpets and the bowls and then worship. We'll encounter some beasts and we're brought back into worship. Throughout the book, Revelation keeps coming back to worship. This is where we belong. This picture uh, Dr. Kester put on the front cover of his book, it pictures a multitude that no one can count gathered around worshiping the Lamb. This is where we belong. I will close with Charles Wesley's version of Revelation 7:12 that I just read. From the hymn, uh, Ye Servants of God. Then let us adore and give him his right, all glory and power, all wisdom and might, all honor and blessing with angels above, and thanks never ceasing, and infinite love. Amen. Methodists may not read Revelation much, but we sing it a lot. Let's continue singing our worship before the throne and before the Lamb with our closing hymn, and it was influenced by Revelation also. Number 98, to God be the glory. <laughs> Sorry, I, I tricked you. <laughs>
Sorry about that. Have to do both. And again, let's hear the words of Charles Wesley. Then let us adore and give him his right, all glory and power, all wisdom and might, all honor and blessing with angels above and thanks never ceasing, and then with an infinite love. Amen.